Okay, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Sierra, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on building a virtual presence for telehealth substance use treatment. This is our third webinar in a five-part series on youth and substance use prevention and treatment. Next slide, please. We'd like to thank our funders from the California Youth Opioid Response for supporting this project. Um, next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be posted on our website as well as emailed to you after this presentation. Um, we are going to be answering questions somewhat throughout, but there will also be time at the end to answer questions. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance, in case you're not already familiar with us. We're a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do this through two main avenues. We advocate for more school-based health centers, and we support and improve the already existing school-based health centers. We do this through a variety of ways, um, policy, capacity building, technical assistance, like today's workshop, um, and our conference, which I'll actually have on the next slide. But if you'd like to learn more about us, you can see our link to our website. And this is our conference. Uh, it is going to be on Friday, April 29th, right now, in person at the University of Red Redlands in San Bernardino. So we really hope that you all can join us. Next slide, please. And um, our membership, if you aren't already, we do encourage you to become a member. Uh, you get a big conference registration discount that makes it worthwhile, as well as technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. So there's a link there if you'd like to sign up. And then next slide. And now I would like to pass it off to Nancy Rogan and Mary Ellen Evers, who are going to provide us training today on building a virtual presence for telehealth substance use treatment. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for the uh, having us present. My name is Nancy Rogat, and I am located at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and I am uh, presenting today for the Pacific Southwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center, which is a SAMHSA funded uh, project. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, Mary Ellen. Hello. Do you <laughs> want to introduce yourself a little bit, Mary Ellen? Sure. Thanks for having me, Nancy. My name is Mary Ellen Evers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, uh, certified advanced uh, alcohol and drug counselor here in Northeast Pennsylvania. So about uh, all private practice, about 15 years ago, I worked in Florida with an organization called Operation PAR. And we were provided grants early on in looking at the use of telehealth. Uh, through the years, I was trained as well through CASAT and the ATTC. Um, I've done multiple trainings. The state of Florida has brought me back in as a subject matter expert to help create their certification process. I'm currently teaching at the University of Reno uh, the clinical aspects of telehealth. So a lot of in the trenches experiences and knowledge I'm looking forward to sharing today. And again, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks again, Sierra, and uh, we'll get started with the presentation, and please put any questions you have into, is it the Q&A box or the chat box, uh, Sierra? It's the chat box. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sierra will be monitoring that for us. Um, so uh, once again, uh, we're excited to talk about one of our uh, favorite topics, and uh, Mary, and El Mary Ellen and I will go back and forth. Um, so once again, this is sponsored by the Pacific Southwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Uh, it's a project sponsored by uh, SAMHSA, uh, federal government, and you can see there are 10 uh, ATTCs located throughout the United States, and uh, we're representing Pacific Southwest with uh, that takes care of the training and technical assistance for Nevada, California, Arizona, Hawaii, and then the Pacific uh, jurisdictions. And we'll have contact information for you at the end of the presentation that you can access more training and technical assistance through the Pacific Southwest 
ATTC, as well as uh, my contact information if you have specific questions. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about uh, telehealth, and we're going to focus uh, more specifically on the use of telehealth. Uh, and um, you can see here we're using the term telebehavioral health. That's certainly a mouthful when we're presenting, and so we'll go back and forth uh, calling uh, uh, what we're doing or what we're talking about by various terms. So telebehavioral health, video conferencing, telehealth, virtual service delivery, you'll hear us use all different kinds of phrases, but we're talking about the delivery of services using audio and visual means uh, on a, a virtual platform. Uh, we're going to talk about the research base and then clients and patients and what the research says about their uh, liking or um, dislike of using uh, telebehavioral health. We'll talk about clinicians and their attitudes towards uh, telebehavioral health. And then really we'll spend the majority of our presentation on engagement, therapeutic alliance, and presence in, in counseling, as well as then your telepresence, which is a new term um, that we found in the literature and that uh, we really like and we think uh, describes um, the work that folks do. And uh, we'll talk about some tips and another favorite subject of ours is disinhibition effect about how uh, virtual service, to, uh, virtual um, activity can cause folks to feel more casual. And Mary Ellen's got several great <laughs> examples of that and, and uh, issues to be aware of. We'll mention guidelines, lessons learned, uh, safety issues, and then some summary and concluding thoughts. Um, and uh, you will be able to get a PDF copy of our presentation. And um, well, like I said, you can always uh, contact us with any additional uh, questions that um, you have. So Mary Ellen, do you wanna add anything to our outline here before I jump ahead? No, I think it was pretty thorough. We got a lot to go over today, so yes, I think we should we dive do. right in. Okay, great. Thanks. So we're going to make the case. Telebehavioral health in the form of synchronous, meaning live, video and audio is effective, well-received, and a really a standard way to practice now, especially in 2022. Mm -hmm. But the literature supports this. So if people say to you, oh, I don't know, virtual service delivery, telehealth, I don't know if it works. It does work and it is effective and patients and clients do like it. And certainly what uh, Sierra referenced uh, with the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or public health emergency, what we saw was this huge uptake in uh, uh, the use of uh, virtual service uh, delivery. So, people act like, oh my gosh, this we just started doing telehealth. Actually, we didn't. Telehealth has, uh, or telebehavioral health specifically, has been around for a long time. And actually, it started back in 1959, before um, probably most of you were born. Um, unfortunately, not before I was born. But anyway, uh, at the University of Nebraska, and um, they began using video conferencing to do treatment, and actually they ran a group there. Um, and then also this picture is actually from a telemedicine clinic at Boston's Logan Airport where they, in the 1960s, where they were translating pictures. You can see here x-rays uh, virtually uh, from the airport to Mass General uh, Hospital. Um, also, we have enough research now to know uh, that delivering manual, uh, manualized treatment or evidence-based practices uh, through video conferencing is just as effective as face-to-face. -face. And it, in looking at, this was a recent, and a really well done systematic review of video conferencing uh, for um, behavioral health services. And this is what they found was uh, the positives were ease of use, 
improved outcomes and communication and adherence to medication went up. Um, and missed appointments went down, wait times went down, readmissions went down, and patient travel time went down. Very important. Okay. Um, and what do we know about patients? Well, or clients, um, all patient populations I highlighted there for you, children and adolescents, uh, uh, consistently report satisfaction with services delivered via uh, telebehavioral health that, and also seniors, minority populations and individuals in the justice system all report satisfaction with uh, the delivery of behavioral health services through uh, uh, video conferencing. What about group? Everybody goes, oh my gosh, I don't know. Can't You can't do group. You can't do group online. And actually you can. Recent study by Lopez, uh, you can see here. And I, I want to tell you, all of our slides have citations on them and you can look them up um, and find the references. And we frequently update our references. So hopefully if something's older than five years, it's because it's a seminal uh, citation. Um, but this, this study found that, um, you know, people were like, uh, who participated in the group were like, yeah, it's not my first choice to do this, but man, if I didn't have this online group, I wouldn't have been able to come to services. Uh, and Mary Ellen, do you want to add anything in here about group? Just that we know clinically it again, I use the term a lot, it's the same but different, um, just as effective, just some tweaks, not as many people in the group, having somebody do the group with you, um, the co-facilitator kind of works the back door with any technical issues, while the primary counselor works the, the evidence-based program. Um, there's research out there, we'll talk more, but, you know, th there is that connection with the folks that we work with in the group setting, equally, uh, if it's done through the computer compared to when they are face-to-face -face groups. Yep. All sorts of different group issues, but we'll, we'll get to some of that. Mm -hmm. But there is some research in supporting uh, that uh, patients were like, oh, it's not my favorite doing group online, but I need a group and um, it worked out well and I preferred it over uh, no treatment or uh, limited access to treatment services. This is where the rub comes in. And, and what we have here is that providers express more concerns about, well, I don't know if we can actually do our treatment services online. And so we, what we have here is reluctant providers rather than reluctant patients. Yes. And we saw that a lot, I think, early on too in yeah. the, the pandemic where clinicians would log on and say, I'm not thrilled about this, but it's all we have. And that was, you know, you're not modeling um, much positive thought. And so they discovered that, that clinicians who were kind of modeling that negativity left the, the, the clients and the patients feeling much more negative or resistant to the work done through the computer compared to those who kind of saw the potential and saw the use of it and kind of bought into it. Great point. So here's uh, two or three different uh, research articles that said the clinicians use of uh, telebehavior help. Uh, they had concerns about software programs or the technology, confidentiality, privacy and security issues, questions about its efficacy, which Mary Ellen just addressed, and then regulatory concerns like uh, can we actually do this? What, uh, you know, will we get reimbursed? Um, those are all concerns that we, not only the literature shows, but certainly, Mary Ellen, that you hear from people that you're instructing about the use of uh, telehealth. Yes. Also, a more recent article said that um, clinicians uh, had concerns about delivering telehealth and being able to engage and develop a therapeutic uh, alliance or a therapeutic relationship uh, with their patients or clients. And so you can see here, this is some of the concerns that uh, uh, the researchers found in this particular article. Uh, I'm not a tech expert. 
I might miss something if the sound is poor. I couldn't, I, I might miss visual cues. Uh, you know, what should I do? Uh, you know, am I going to have difficulty projecting empathy? Mary Ellen, you want to add anything to this? Well, you know, I, we're going to get into it more later, but to me, the number one is always, I look at the one there that says, what if your client leaves the session and the importance of safety when, when providing telehealth services, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people walked into it with a lot of initial concerns, discovering that there's ways to do it. There are ways to do it. And there are uh, guidelines and uh, structure that you can put in to, help you and more importantly to help your uh, patient or client have a good experience uh, virtually. Okay, this is sort of what uh, Mary Ellen was referring to about check your attitude. Um, this was a study that was done a while back, you can see 2005, and they uh, the researchers um, were testing the ability to develop a therapeutic alliance uh, virtually. Uh, and so what they did is they uh, took psychologists and they put them into two groups. And uh, prior to that, they, uh, they developed a video of someone doing a session um, virtually uh, and then someone doing a session in person. And there were scripts, you know, it was not a real client, but there were scripts and the sessions were done exactly the same. So 15 psychologists viewed a video of an in-person session and rated it the Therapeutic Alliance. And another group uh, viewed a video um, of the telehealth session and they rated the Therapeutic Alliance. And the telehealth session was rated lower in Therapeutic Alliance than the in-person session, even though the sessions were identical. And so what we're talking about here is like, what's our attitude towards telehealth? or through the, uh, towards the use of virtual service delivery. And we project that attitude if we're not careful, if we have um, negative thoughts about it, or we're un even if we're unsure about it, and it's okay to be unsure about it. Um, it and um, certainly Mary Ellen, I don't know if you started off going, oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread when you were at Operation Par. Oh, I had a lot of, of fear and reservation. I mean, we're going back 15 years ago. Uh, I think my very first patient, patient, believe it or not, was a bus driver uh, for the city of St. Pete. Uh, but no, it, it was, oh, I was scared of it. Um, and now it's all I do, <laughs> which is kind of interesting to see how it's changed. Right. You know, but it's not for everybody. You know, it's, it's not a cookie cutter. Not every clinician can do it. And not every, every client or patient is, is appropriate for it. Good point. I remember you telling me a story where your executive director said, we're going to do this. And you said, excuse me, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. We have a. We have a question. Yeah, something popped up here in the. Okay. It, so it says, is this talking about a single session that between client and provider in person that was filmed and presented as a tele session as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, the research. The Nancy, research this question. One yeah. session, Nance, that the research you I'm not, I'm not hearing the, I didn't hear the question as well. So. Um, is this talking about a single session that between client and provider in person that was filmed and presented as a telehealth session as well? Yes, it was a single session and uh, they, you know, um, they rated and they rated the therapeutic alliance and it was all scripted out. And so they had filmed both and they used the same therapist and client and uh, in each and um, they did it. They did it exactly the same. Only one was filmed in a virtual. Um, uh, what can I say? Like scenario or or uh, look and feel, and the other one was in a regular uh, counseling office. And um, yeah, it was just one session, but it exactly the same. Uh, and it uh, it did show the site. The fifteen psychologists said. Said, rated the telehealth session uh, lower in Therapeutic Alliance. 
So it's just a nice reminder to check our attitudes and to uh, go, oh, I don't know if you can mm -hmm. have a therapeutic, you know, as uh, maybe as in depth or as effective on online services. And basically uh, what the research has shown is that you can and that patients like it and there's similar outcomes. Um, and uh, we have to be, uh, it requires some sk different skills for the therapist. So um, let's see. So, so this goes on to what some of the things Mary Ellen said, uh, the more knowledge you have, the more skills you have, the more favorable but attitude uh, clinicians tend to have towards uh, the use of uh, telebehavioral health. And uh, really like learning any kind of evidence-based practice in counseling, like learning MI, same with telehealth. You practice with feedback, you get, uh, op you uh, observe colleagues doing their work, and you access experts to help build your competency. And we really believe in knowledge, feedback, observation, and working with experts is helpful. Um, we want to leave you with this piece when we're looking at the research. Really, telebehavioral health really requires a change for the clinician. Mm -hmm. And so most of the burden uh, really ends up being on the clinician rather than the patient in doing telebehavioral health. Now, think about it. Mary Ellen, jump in at any time. Yep. You know, so <laughs> I'm a counselor. I like, uh, I am doing services at an outpatient clinic or in a school. I go out, I greet my patient, I go back to our office, my office, I do my session, I walk the patient client back out, uh, they meet with the receptionist, we uh, or we scheduled our next appointment, and we're done. Um, I'm done, and, except for making notes or, or whatever. But the patient's done all this work to get there. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, get childcare, have to drive to their appointment, or the parents have to bring the child in. There's a lot of work done by the patient. With telebehavioral health, most of the work, right, Marilyn, falls yes. on the clinician. Very much so. It changed my uh, my routine tremendously. You know, I always I used to joke about how in between sessions I would sit in my chair and, and play Scrabble until the next person showed up. I didn't have to do anything because they came to me um, with telehealth, right? I've got to send them the link to I use Zoom. So like my morning is sending out the Zoom links to everybody, making sure any um, uh, handouts I may use or videos I may share during a session are loaded and ready to go on my computer so I don't risk sharing confidential information. Um, you know, it, it's not just kind of sitting there waiting for them to show up and me jotting the note. It's me doing much more preparing uh, and then also helping them if there's any issues with logging on. So just the, the showing up for the session, the onus is placed on me more so than the patient when doing telehealth. Never mind the actual clinical work we have to do. Great points, great points. So why should we deliver SUD treatment services using utilizing telehealth? Because guess what? Access is a huge issue. I just took this from the SAMHSA website. This is the national uh, study on uh, drug use and health that comes out every year. Uh, and so you may say to yourself, well, why isn't it 2021? Well, we'll get 2021 data in uh, August 2022, all right? Mm -hmm. So we're always like a year behind. But what this shows is that less than, man, we, you know, people that had a substance use disorder, you can see less than 10% got treatment services. And part of that is an access issue. We don't make it easy for folks to uh, get treatment services, let alone all the stigma that's associated with entering uh, SUD treatment, okay? Yep. So also we have to remind ourselves now that folks do, many folks have access uh, to uh, smartphones. This is 85% of adults uh, own a smartphone, which is up like 35% uh, in 11 years. 
Uh, and this one I found fascinating. Uh, new data, US smartphone users check their phones more than 344 times a day, approximately every four minutes. And so when we think we have a lot of folks that um, are doing, uh, receiving their treatment services um, on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that because uh, folks have difficulty uh, accessing uh, monitors or, pa or pads. Uh, Operation PAR, where uh, Mary Ellen worked, they used to give uh, the women in their women's treatment, uh, SUD treatment program, uh, their own iPads. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're seeing some treatment providers do that as well. Okay, so access to technology is increasing in some cases. Certainly we know there are areas where people don't have access to the internet. And so that becomes a, a problem. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's in the cities and certainly it's in rural areas. But we do know that use of uh, smartphones and access to smartphones uh, is going up. And certainly with adolescents and young adults, everything's about the phone. Yep. Uh, if you have a 21, a 20 year old living with you or uh, a 20 year old uh, uh, person, um, you can guarantee that uh, more than likely they um, uh, don't have iPads, they're using their phone, uh, and if they have a computer, it uh, might they might use a computer at school. Uh, but uh, so don't forget about the use of a uh, phone. So, Sierra, do we have any questions before we jump into our next section? No, no, no additional questions yet. Okay, great. This is one of our favorite sections to talk about. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about engagement, mm -hmm. engagement, presence, and therapeutic alliance. And I'm sure, we're sure many of you uh, had all this uh, information uh, taught to you while you were uh, getting your different uh, counseling uh, degrees or social work degrees, but we're just going to review it. And then we're going to talk about engagement, presence, and therapeutic alliance via uh, telehealth. So certainly we know that one of the most important tenets of therapeutic relationship is engagement, which is the key for effective treatment. Mm -hmm. Patient engagement is de defined as the degree which patients actively participate in care. And here's a longer definition, and I'll just read it for folks that... Um, maybe on the phone uh, so and not having access to uh, the slides right now, but uh, NAMI uh, defined uh, engagement as the strength-based process through which individuals with mental health conditions form a healing connection uh, and uh, with someone that supports their recovery and wellness within the context of their culture and community, and that becomes part of this therapeutic alliance. I think, Nance, too, what's important to, to keep in mind as we go through these slides is that, you know, the work that folks are doing is with adolescents. And we already know addiction is a family disease or a disease of the family. Um, so, you know, as we talk about engagement and, and presence and, and effective treatment, um, you know, we're also talking about working with the parents when you're dealing with the the 13 year old who got caught using you know on school property let's say and what we're talking when we say the word patient or client i guess what i'm saying is we also mean dealing with the caregiver as well yep definitely this is probably uh, mary ellen i don't know if you want to take this slide but this is like a really important quote and i really and i really like it um yeah no this is a great Great quote. I love it too. It's our highest calling is to comfort others in their suffering, a fundamental contribution to our own sense of purpose and meaning in our work. While there is no standard definition, we identify presence as undistracted healing engagement between clinician and patient. And the reason, right, we highlight undistracted is because we could get distracted easily depending on our environmental setup with providing telehealth services and the folks we work with can become more easily distracted. Um, 
when working with us and we have to navigate that we've got to be aware of it and we have to navigate it so there is no distraction and that engagement can be as healing as possible absolutely and i i want you to think about a uh, uh, distraction and like if you were doing an in-person session mary ellen let's say and um you picked up your phone in the middle of an in-person session which would never would happen never ha- that would mm-hmm. never happen I mean, unless you were getting an emergency call or something like that, but in a telehealth session, you have to be, I mean, do you like lock your phone up when you're doing sessions? I personally keep my phone upside down over there on a table that I can't get to. Um, (laughs) I think one, (laughs) because it's a temptation, right? We're going to talk about that with a disinhibition, but it's kind of this temptation of like, hmm, you know? Um, likely to, right? Cause the kids we all know are very computer literate. They will have their text messages go right into their computer. I have some that are all iPhone or Apple product. <laughs> and so if a text comes from a friend while they're in a session with me, the text is also coming up on their computer screen mm. and I have to, you know, educate them and also navigate that with them so that they're not distracted um, happens with adults too, but, you know, to keep them engaged and not, you know, get caught up in, in what's popping up on their screen. Right. So when we're building this therapeutic relationship and then we're building it virtually, it becomes more complicated. It does. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Presence and counseling sessions. Marianne, I'll let you take this. A lot of data on this particular chart, which are, are uh, slide, um, but and you can refer to it later on. Yeah, just you know, this idea of the presence it, it enables us to be there emotionally, cognitively, um, in touch with the folks we work with. Um, I need to be present so I can assess for safety. Um, It helps my relationship, again, with the folks I'm working with. It's crucial uh, for them to feel my presence for the therapy to work. Um, Absolutely. You know, people will often say, well, I don't feel connected. And I kind of coined this term uh, a few years back with telehealth, where I have to listen with my eyes and see with my ears. Um, because it is my presence is different and how I take things in is going to be different when it's through a synchronous you know the synchronous modality of telehealth Um, they want to they being the client they want to see me engaged and and I want to see them engaged and I'm the role model of what presence should look like so You know, if I am reaching over to look at my phone, if, if I am doodling or, you know, doing something like this, um, again, I'm modeling that I'm not present for them. And it's going to affect so much in the session, not just how they act, but their progress, our relationship. Um, there could be a lot of consequences. So it really, the presence really is I'm the model and I have to help guide them for it to be as a successful, you know, uh, counseling relationship as possible. It's a good, at bottom, right? Therapeutic alliance is a good predictor of success. Yep, absolutely. Look at tons of research, uh, what people measure, uh, what researchers measure is, um, uh, and there's different instruments out there to measure the therapeutic alliance. Uh, and, uh, you know, if your therapeutic alliance is low, p- uh, clients, patients, uh, their satisfaction with the treatment services is lower as well. And outcomes are poor. Yes. So a uh, therapeutic alliance ha- consists of three critical factors And I I look at this, Mary Ellen, and I'm like, oh, man, this is like raising kids. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, (laughs) it is. Yeah. You need clear expectations and goals with the uh, between that the patients and the client, uh, patients, clients, and and the therapists, uh, counselors uh, define. There's a clear definition of what I'm going to do versus what you're going to do if you're my patient. And three, the relationship uh, has to include building trust and respect and having a bond. 
And I think what's interesting, Nance, is this actually, as I'm reading this and, and thinking about the, you know, this slide, this actually gets started in the informed consent, At the very, very beginning of yep. treatment. Right. Yep. So often we go, here's the paperwork, sign here, date here, X, Y, Z. And we highlight, right? We give them the highlight of, of usually a multi-page form because um, we don't want to waste time. We want to get right into the clinical. Um, but these three elements or these three factors get created in the, in the informed consent where we do lay out those clear expectations and we define all of those things. Um, happens from the very beginning. Yep. Great point. So really the goal with technology is to simulate this real time experiences related to feelings, perception, uh, images, and we create this environment that facilitates this therapeutic engagement. And it's our responsibility, right, Mary Ellen, mm -hmm. as the provider to create this environment and to make sure that there's therapeutic engagement and um, emotional well-being. Very much so. Yep. The, again, the onus is on us. Yep. So now this is where the rub comes in, right? Technology may change the nature of the interaction and the communication, but, um, you know, it doesn't change what our, our duty is mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to make sure that sessions have clarity and that we're responsive and that the patient is comfortable that comes back to us. Again, yeah. Okay. Oops, sorry. So um, what we're looking to do here is um, literally, and I, I like to do it by pictures. So what we're looking to do here is uh, translate our clinical skills, okay? Uh, so that what we do in person, if you see the picture at the bottom, is, is the same as what we're doing virtually. It's the same, but different. Yes, we same have to but be, different. yes, Thank we you. have to be aware of the differences, but yeah, it, we can do it. We are yeah. doing it. So um, Groom is this great article and they, uh, she defined uh, telepresence uh, and said, okay, so we have this presence in counseling. Uh, let's talk about how we do that virtually. And so she could coin the phrase telepresence, mm -hmm. which we think is j just a, uh, it helps us uh, refer to uh, what folks do um, when they're providing services virtually. So you can see here, she says, telepresence is broadly described as a mental state in which a user feels physically presence, present within a computer mediated environment. Great definition. Mm -hmm. And then telepresence is the patient's ca caregivers and clinicians experienced realism during a telehealth session that is created through connection, collaboration, built on trust support and the clinician skills as acting as the technology mediator. What do you think, Mary Ellen? I like that. I think what's real important to, to note too is the technology mediator, not the technology guru. Um, we don't have to be technology gurus to have a telepresence or to help the folks we work with navigate uh, the computer to be able to have sessions. Real quick, quick story. Just today, I reconnected with an old client of mine who decided finally um, to come back to treatment through Zoom. And in the middle of it, she went, oh, this is just like watching church on TV on Sundays. Um, you know, it was kind of this aha moment for her uh, because she didn't think that it was gonna kind of fall into that first definition, that mental state where they felt physically present with me, even though she was sitting at her desk at her house. Um, so, you know, it, it happens and it's kind of fun watching it happen. Oh, yeah. So um, Grim went on to say in defining telepresence, she uh, goes to a further definition of connection, technology mediation, discomfort or trust, support, 
and collaboration and experience realism. And we're gonna go through all of these so we can talk about the importance of building and developing your telepresence skills. So Mary Ellen, I'll start here and then I'll uh, just jump in, okay? You got it. Um, so how do we build a connection, all right? And um, one of the things is that, uh, as Mary Ellen said, you know, she has a, a phrase that she uses. Um, say it again for me about listen. listening with, with. Oh, I, I listen with my eyes and I see with my ears. Yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to uh, look at body language and then ask clarifying questions and be aware that your attention could be divided between your the patient, family members, other caregivers, and then computer or uh, technology issues while you're making these connections. And that can be difficult. Yeah, it, it can be. You know, one of the things that we have um, colleagues and, and, and people in the trenches have learned with connection is don't let um, couples or families share the same computer. Um, have everyone go into a separate room. Um, so that, you know, uh, the attention, right. You put there about the attention being divided. Uh, I have a couple of colleagues who more than once had the computer staring up at the ceiling fan because a tussle, uh, happened during the session when they were sharing the same iPad. Um, you know, we want to be connected to everybody that we're working with. One of the ways in telehealth and doing that is to have everybody with their own device, even if they're in the same home. Good point. The last bullet point here we think is really important as well, and that's like you're going to have to do um, heighten your gestures, your verbalness, you might, and you may have to take the lead more. So you might have to yep. be more directive. Much more what, directive what and think? also, yeah, definitely more directive. Also a lot more, um, a lot of reflective listening, you know, just to verify, like, am I, I think what I'm hearing or what I'm hearing you say, or what you seem to be saying, um, is that what you're telling me just to, uh, be sure what you're picking up is, is what you're picking up. Great points. So trust. Mary Ellen, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Eye contact is huge. Eye contact is actually very, uh, a, a big issue when it comes to telepresence as well. And the angle, um, you know, one of course being, and we always kind of joke about, you know, you, you don't want to work with somebody who's necessarily doing this. Um, it's, it's much more relaxed and casual, but there is this piece of, um, I have a little dot on my camera. And so every now and then I just take a piece, take a peek at the dot, uh, cause that is reflective of, of eye contact, um, you know, they want to see me engaged again too, right? I'm in the middle of the screen. Here I am. There's the screen behind me. They know that I have no distractions. Uh, right. And as a great reminder is looking at the camera, not the screen. And that's where uh, uh, if you're new to this, doing uh, telehealth, you may look at the screen mm -hmm. rather than looking at the camera. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one of the tricks I do also is I will move um, the screen to underneath the camera so that I can see myself and the person and the camera are all lined up. So there's okay. little tricks, right, that you'll learn right. um, because the eye contact creates trust. Keep in mind, too, eye contact is with cultural. There's some other there's some other cultural issues to be mindful of when it comes to eye contact. Um you know, but definitely, you know, it has an effect on, on the trust. There is also this piece of folks who worked with me face-to-face -face prior to me going all telehealth definitely experienced um, this feeling of trust. But the new folks I work with who have never met me and they can feel my engagement, um, you know, they sense that I'm here and they sense that I'm engaging and they sense that I'm invested in them. And, and that becomes this very important role when uh, building the trust with the folks I work with. Good point. Let's go to the next one and that's support. Uh, so certainly, obviously, if uh, folks are, the longer folks are in treatment, the uh, uh, more trust builds, the better su support uh, patient feels. 
uh, familiarity builds between patients uh, and their uh, treatment and recovery teams, and they feel more supported. And uh, this is an interesting point about, and we just talked a little bit about it, but researchers found that video screen invites int intensive gazing. Uh, and it's like, if you're on a lot of meetings uh, lately on Zoom, it's like, oh my God, I have to look at myself again. Yes. But um, we know that people do do intensive gazing. And while patients are speaking, observe them and provide supportive statements to help them verbalize these issues. Yeah, I think another piece here, uh, and this is as an aside what support is, and this goes back to my saying, what are you hearing outside of what's on the computer screen, right? So quick example, I don't know if, if you can hear that, but I have a woman who will play with her hands on her desk when she's more anxious. So I don't see it, but I hear it. I've got another gentleman who plays with a drawer when he becomes upset. So I have to be mindful of that and then show that support to them because something's going on that I can't see. Sorry about that. My, uh, I had moved my phone away and I bumped it. So there's That's a okay. great example of uh, distraction. So uh, my apologies. That is okay. So um, the other thing uh, that Groom talks about is collaboration. And there really is this need for this reciprocal flow of openness and, you know, and how do we, how do we create this uh, environment um, that encourages patients and clients to feel like they're collaborating with us, okay? Uh, Mary Ellen, do you have some comments about that or experience? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know, we think we have to think outside of the box. For example, if I have a, a teenager come into my office, you know, we might play a game of cards or we might, you know, play a game of chess um, and then try to, you know, create some converse, some therapeutic conversation um, or we might do some kind of art stuff. There are ways to do all of that through the computer now. Uh, to bring into the session to help build that collaboration or that collaborative spirit with the folks we work with. Early on in providing telehealth, um, I did think it had to be just like face-to-face. -face. I have learned that if I got, a, uh, quite honestly, if I have a teenager who is playing a video game, we create a deal. Um, I give them a little video time, but then we also have face-to-face -face focus time. Um, again, right. Some treatments better than no treatment at all. And if it gets them talking to me, I'm going to relax it and I'm going to, you know, work with them on it. So there's definitely different ways to collaborate, um, that people have used through telehealth. Um, realism and emotional consequence and really, you know, when we're doing our job, we want to be fully present in this remote uh, location and we ha it needs to you know we need to create this space where patients feel it's as strong as a face-to-face -face, uh, visit and that you're in I like this phrase Mary Ellen like you're in the, you're you are together in this in your respective rooms but you're mm -hmm. together yeah yeah and, and sometimes this, does, this no, doesn't happen naturally you have mm -hmm. to create this Is, do you agree with the, the statement here yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Sometimes it's as simple as um, showing them what's behind my screen, right? Because they're curious. They, they want to feel connected and they want to have a better idea of really where I am. And so I will, inv I, I will be open to that. And then I'll ask them to show me where they are and, you know, comment on maybe posters they have on the wall or things like that um, and respect their room that they're in with me. And often I will thank them for inviting me into their room um, so that we can have that, that respect for one another. Um, you know, I, I don't expect them to necessarily log on in an aesthetically pleasing, you know, office setting or at a table in their kitchen. They're, you know, especially adolescents, they're gonna log on where they log on and um, they may need some guidance but I want them to be comfortable and I want them to, you know, 
I want to be with them where they're at. So there's ways we do that. Yep, absolutely. Um, the, the second piece, or this last piece uh, of the telepresence, according to Groom, is about uh, technology and the use of technology. And I want to make a comment, and then I'll let you uh, uh, take this as well, Mary Ellen. But I think back to um, uh, sort of bumbling around like this, like this morning with uh, Sierra. I was trying to show my slides and was having a little bit of difficulty, and it's like man, you got to be good with the technology, especially if you're, you're dealing with uh, treating uh, adolescents. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the last thing they want is um, to be uh, working with a counselor who has trouble with the technology if you're seeing an adolescent. It's like, oh, come on. And so, uh, I know we practice at work. Uh, obviously, I've skipped my practices lately, but we practice at work about making sure about our competency with the technology. And do you do that as a counselor as well? Absolutely. Um, our number one ethical responsibility is master of the modality. And the modality is telehealth. Um, even, you know, working with my class uh, at the university, I'm going to practice, uh, you know, my questionnaires or my breakout rooms um, or my polling questions just to see how it works before I bring it to the class. Um, if there's a, let's say, a YouTube video that I want to bring in that talks about um, or demonstrates maybe mindfulness, I'm going to practice it prior to me bringing it into the session because I don't want to get shocked with something else happening. I think one of the biggest things as the clinician, no matter what age you're working with, is to remember just to stay cool, calm, and collective. Excuse me, it's not the end of the world if the computer goes blank. Um, it happens sometimes. It's, we roll with it, right? Um, we also, though, have that backup plan that's discussed, again, right at the informed consent early on. If I disappear, this is what you do. If you disappear, this is what I need you to do. Um, and we just kind of just roll with it and keep going. It doesn't mean the session's over. Um, right. it, you know, we kind of drop back and punt. So it's so, our responsibility to uh, help out with the technology. Mm -hmm. If a patient client's having difficulty, keep doing the session because we know that the clinical piece is, is the most important and don't let technical issues, if there's some distraction in the background uh, with the uh, patient or client, it's like, it's okay, we can work through this, a dog barking, yep. um, some uh, baby crying, uh, those type of things, we can work through it. And yep. we also have to make decisions like, hey, let's switch to the phone, mm -hmm. or hey, let's reschedule our session, or uh, you know, just checking in. Do you agree with all that? I do agree. And the other piece too is sometimes playing ignorant is a wonderful therapeutic tool in working with young, young adults, uh, kids and adolescents. Um, I let them show me how to work it. And oh. I let them educate me on, you know, oh, what do I click here? Um, that's also another tool that is very empowering for some of the kids we work with. Is, is letting them think they're teaching us. And sometimes they are teaching us because I Absolutely. certainly can't, I can't keep up with everything out there. Yep. Um, apps and this and that. So uh, yeah, sometimes they can teach us and it becomes part of the session. So we're going to move now into ethical duties and we're doing sort of a 360 degree view of uh, ethics. And, but this is something that... Um, uh, we feel pretty strongly about that. Uh, we have to demonstrate our uh, one of our ethical duties of providing services uh, virtually is demonstrating our competency with the technology. Uh, and uh, minimally, uh, uh, clinicians need to show their capacity to use technology with basic skills and troubleshoot. You don't have to be a computer expert, right? Or a technology expert. You have to be able to help and advise patients with their use of a selected uh, technology platform. And then this last piece we haven't uh, talked about, Mary Ellen, but if you can spend like two seconds on it, because I'm looking at our time. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's our, also our ethical duty to say, I chose this platform. Here's why. 
This is uh, privacy and security issues, and that we provide that information back to the patient and client before services are delivered. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what people are going to say, but I'm comfortable on um, Google Hangout or I'm comfortable on on Facebook. And we have to have a, a succinct way of saying I use Zoom because it's encrypted. Your information is safe um, and, and just kind of get to that point when it comes to the 42 CFR part two or HIPAA compliance issues and why the platform we use we're choosing. Yep. So here's some other uh, pieces about uh, technology, which we thought was was great, that mm -hmm. um, actually some populations are more comfortable with technology. Mm -hmm. Children in general report novelty, like, oh, this is cool. I like doing my sessions uh, on uh, a video conferencing platform. And um, also clients with really significant behavioral or conduct disorders or SUD, substance use disorder, feel like they're less, they have less stigma. And really, and patients with anxiety disorders uh, report less anxiety with telehealth. So they don't feel as judged or mm -hmm. sitting in the waiting room and waiting to see the counselor and, oh my gosh, you know, uh, what does this mean? And, and all those types of things. So we do know there's some great uh, benefits with technology. Yeah, the kids definitely, the adolescents definitely don't necessarily, from, from my own experiences with, with the adolescents that I've worked with, they have shared. It's, it's not like I'm being brought here to force to sit in this waiting room and then forced to go upstairs and talk to you. Um, it's, it's a more casual feeling for them and, and they're less defensive and more open to talking. Yep. Uh, you can do this last point here is great. A patient's perspective is best captured in his or her primary language uh, or a use of an interpreter. The research shows that communication with synchronous video is less problematic than asynchronous communication using English as a second language. So um, really important to keep uh, la language of the uh, patient or client in mind and that it works over uh, video conferencing if the counselor speaks the same language. Yes. Uh, and um, we're gonna talk about the little things, but man, they're important. Mm -hmm. uh, the office, a typical appointment link, the regular schedule of appointments are really instrumental in developing this a uh, positive environment and therapeutic frame. And Mary Ellen and I talk about this all the time and it does seem like little things, but it's the little things that provide the structure, yeah. right? And it's the little things that go and create security and trust and confidentiality. So the client feels like they're, they're speaking confidentially and they're able to discuss anything in, you know, even though it's this mediated type of session. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. My headset, although I'm not fond of the one I'm wearing today, it's my backup, but um, my headset is one nonverbal way of demonstrating to them that um, there's a level of security and confidentiality. They know that only I can hear them through the headpiece. Great a point. Little, a little thing. Um, Great point. I put my Zoom invites out usually about 8 a.m., and it was ironic. It was just a lesson learned. One day I had a dentist appointment and I came home around 10 o'clock with my, my work phone blowing up going, I didn't get the Zoom link. I didn't get the Zoom link. Are we having a session today? Uh, people were used to getting their, their session link by eight o'clock in the morning. Um, again, a little thing, but it creates this therapeutic frame and this foundation with the folks I work with that, you know, they are trusting that I'm going to be there and they are expecting it. Great points. So there is um, a great, a great tip sheet that, well, there's tips out there and we're going to go over some of those with you. Um, the tip sheet can be found at the South Southwest attc.org. You can see the uh, link down in the corner. Um, and we have tips on establishing a screen signing manner, do's and don'ts, setting up your office space, and serving as a role model. And we're just going to highlight some of these because there's a ton of tips. Yeah. 
Uh, and usually we spend probably two hours going over uh, just the tips. So, and once again, just a great quote, a nice reminder um, with video, words and body movements replace in-room behaviors. Mm -hmm. I, you know, for example, a handshake, like how do you greet a client? Mary Ellen, do you have a greeting that you have found works pretty well? You know, what's interesting is, again, it's just one of those things. It's me leaning in and my eyebrows going up and I'll go, hey, and they'll go, hey, what's up? And, and that just seems to be the handshake, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of your own style. So you it's my suggest- style. Yep. You would suggest that people create some way that they greet their patients or clients. And it may differ by patient. And you don't even have to create it. Just pay attention to you and what you do when people log on. And I do. I have this tendency to kind of go forward and, again, raise the eyebrows. Um, That's just something I picked up about myself. And that seems to be how people know, like, hey, we're starting. How are you? Okay, good. So um, one of the things I find that when I hear experts like you speak is like being that sort of this balancing between facilitative language and directive and that you might be more directive than in a telehealth session than you than you would in an in-person session where you would, you know, in-person session, sit with the patient for a longer period of time and just say, you, you know, let the process sort of come out slowly. Whereas with telehealth, you might say, what are your thoughts about the yeah. next steps you might take? Sounds like you have a lot of background noise going on. Can you move to a different spot for our session? And so much more directive. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I'll often use the, the term drive the bus. Um, you know, if, yeah. if the person's not engaging, if they do seem distracted, um, you know, but whoo hoo, here I am come on back to me now. What are you looking at on your screen? Um, certainly not something that would necessarily be a, 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 a necessary interruption in a face-to-face session. Um, you know, or if there is more, you know, I've had people with lawnmowers going in the background. And if I discover that it's creating an issue for me, you know, I'll ask them to move to another room or sometimes they log on in an inappropriate place. I've had people log on in a bathroom putting on makeup. Um, and I've had to give them that direction of, okay, like, I'm glad you're comfortable with me, but I, we're therapy here. So yeah, we do a lot more talking in telehealth. Um, definitely solid colors, dresses, if you're going to work and not, not too casual. And we'll be talking about this in just a minute. Yep. As you heard Mary Ellen say, uh, nod your head, lean forward. Um, And actually, people prescribe that make sure your face takes up about two thirds of the screen so people can see you. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, And act a little more animated, uh, but not too animated where you're doing all of this. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Mary Ellen? A hundred percent correct. It's, it's, you know, again, being mindful, but yeah, not tap dancing. Right. Stay seated, don't pace, sounds like my mom, sit up straight. Don't rock, that's a big one. I'll have some folks who will see me in a rocking chair and I have had to say to them, could you please not rock? Um, Because it was, in one case, it was making me nauseous, quite frankly. The person was outside in a rock or on a porch and it was like, they were going to town. Um, It was a real distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh we we hear about this a lot thing uh fidgeting tapping rocking your chair doodling uh being too close or too far away from the camera Mm -hmm. i never had thought about this before but you and i talked about jangly earrings yep jangly Uh earrings and and glasses right i have to watch i have a new light and uh i have to watch if i sit a certain way you're going to get a reflection in my glasses from it uh so it's, it's being mindful of that piece as well. Yep. Uh, gum chewing, uh, eating or drinking during sessions. So think about this. Would you eat in an outpatient in-person session Right. with a, with a client? The answer probably would be no. Right. But yet somehow virtually it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. 
No. Okay. And you know what? The drinking piece is interesting because, you know, if you've watched, I've had a few sips of my soda yeah. um, and I've always been one who has always had a drink in, in a session. For silly as it sounds, one of the things I've learned, though, is um, where I am when I'm taking a sip, because if I'm too close, I they lose my face. Yep. If it's a coffee mug. Right. So oh. they'll lose my face or I want to peek so I can maintain eye contact compared to when I'm in an office or sitting back. It doesn't seem as cumbersome over my entire face when I take a sip. Interesting. OK. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see here, making exaggerated motions with hands. And then this video camera shaming, demanding that a patient or client turn on their camera. There's lots of pros and cons on this topic, isn't there? There's a lot of talk about it. I, I, again, I don't think it's cookie cutter. And I think my clinical opinion has been it's on a, it's on a case by case um, situation, depending on the person and the situation. Um, you don't have to have a person's entire face on the screen if you, you don't want to video shame, but if they have to have some proof that the person's in the session, can the person have the camera um, focused on their hand so that you know that that's their hand and that they're sitting in the session? Um, Good point. You know, there's, there's ways around it, but again, I don't think it's a cookie cutter. I, I think you just have to, you know, look at the situation individually and, and decide which is appropriate and, and which is not, you know, if I'm making somebody good on screen because I want to see you on screen, I don't think that's appropriate. But if my grant or my funder source or something like that says I need to have proof that they're there, then there's ways we can work around it. Right. So you could have someone start and show you the picture and take their camera and, or their phone and show you who's in the room with them. And then yep. they can turn it off and then halfway through, turn it back on again, yep. just to make sure. Okay. Great yep. points. We used to, when we first started out, we were like, you have to have yep. your camera on all the time. Mm -hmm. So, so we've gotten better with that. Yes. We've learned we've, you yeah. know, we've done a lot of experiential learning in this process. It's true. Uh, this is our own grooming issues, right? <laughs> Cleaning one's glasses. You brought that up to me. You're like, Nancy, your glasses. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, they're kind of dirty, huh? And you go, yeah, I can see them on, I can see them. I made sure I cleaned mine before yep. our session today um, or before our my training. Cloth. Yep. yep. There we go. Um, watch out for glare, yeah. reflective glass from artwork. Uh, behind you and um, man make sure you put away uh, any kinds of um, let's say you have a, a Siri a Siri or Alexa or any kind of uh, device in that room uh, and yeah. um, you that's know, huge Nance I, I, I want to spend a moment on that one yep um, because we, a lot of times we don't know again, right? We can only see what we can see. And I've had a number of situations where people have had their Alexa um, or their Google home up on a shelf. And it's only by sheer accident where uh, something in our conversation will set that listening device off. And it's really important to be sure that that listening device is unplugged or not even turned on when they're having a session or that it's an earshot of the session um, because there are apps I know within the Alexa that can let me know what has been asked of the Alexa. Since I run the app in my household, I could see what music the kids are asking for. I could see what silly questions the kids are asking. So that listening device could pick up and break confidentiality without us even realizing it. Great point. Mm -hmm. Great point. Okay. Um, I always like this, like, don't have a, a bunch of uh, stuff on your bookshelf that may distract people like, oh, that looks like an interesting trophy. Wonder. So me as a patient, I may distract myself by looking at what you got on your bookshelf. Um, aim for a neutral backdrop. Don't mm -hmm. sit with a window behind you. We've all learned these lessons over the years. <laughs> uh, yes, we have. I uh, jumped ahead on the Alexa uh, type devices. 
do put a do not disturb sign on your door um, and then make sure that uh, the if you have a office is located in the home and is used for other purposes plan ahead to make sure it's clinically conducive yep. okay that is professional looking not like the guy down here in the corner right exactly okay and we do think it's a, it, it's the little things once again um so good seating adequate lighting secure private uh entries soundproofing uh and if you use more than one office um the room should be professionally similar in design let's say that you're providing a uh, virtual service delivery from two different offices make sure that, that they look the same yeah and that's real interesting and that's something that they're discovering is uh if my if i did have a a home if i did have an office space um you know how just having this screen in my home office compared to what the background would look like in uh, a face-to-face -face office would look like and, and how that changes the feel of the session so that's new newer research is coming out about that it's pretty interesting the other thing that we want to say is uh, be really careful. I have my background blurred, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's all those uh, different uh, backgrounds you can add. And, um, you know, if you have a different one every time, would you do that, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Ellen? No. I, and, pers and again, this is a personal thing. I don't like the blurred background. I ask my people not to use it because I don't always know what's going on back there. Um and uh, I don't like them to use those backgrounds because they can be distracting. You have to have the proper green screen or color. Yep. You know, you got an eyeball coming through the, the San Francisco bridge. And, and so it becomes very distracting. I, it's fun to play with, right. you know, and, but to do it as, as a regular in the session or throughout the entire session, I find I have found it distracting. Good points. Um, and you've touched a little bit upon this, but uh, I really agree with you about it, it's our role to serve as a role model. Um, I want to uh, move this down here a little bit so everybody can see the picture. This is not me in my pajamas <laughs> with my doggy doing a session. Um, but um, we want to make sure that uh, that we do as clinicians serve as a role model um, mm -hmm. and that we dress like we're going to work, uh, that we're on time, uh, that we can, uh, do you use a virtual waiting room? I do. Yes. That's, uh, another layer of protection early on when zoom bombing was occurring. Um, you know, that was another lesson learned early on, um, that anyone could kind of just enter your, your zoom room if you weren't aware of it. So ha having the waiting room, um, and allowing people in is just one more step demonstrating privacy confidentiality yeah yep and uh okay and we're going to talk about this coming up uh it's our next slide uh mm -hmm. we're going to talk about disinhibition effect yeah. uh and so i'm going to move to that yeah because we only got a few more minutes until yep. it's quarter after so we okay. want to give a little time for questions um so we all know that people uh, say and do things in cyberspace that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Uh, and uh, we don't know exactly why, but it is, uh, but it does occur. Mm -hmm. And they titled this, even though it was a long time ago, uh, Suler did, called it uh, online disinhibition effect. And um, what happens here is that we have to be really careful that we, um, because of this, that we're not too casual mm -hmm. with our uh, clients or patients. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So with the flexibility in doing virtual service delivery, we can work from anywhere. We could work on vacation, Mary Ellen. We yeah. could work any time. <laughs> we could have sessions at 10 o'clock at night. We could work from public locations. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I won't even, uh, working from a coffee house. Uh, that's a big no-no, um, an ability to dress more casually. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, we've got to be really careful about this and that we treat it like a session. We're being paid to do a session uh, either by the patient or by our employer. 
we would uh, never come to um, work uh, wearing uh, pajama bottoms and slippers mm -hmm. uh, to a regular office. So something, somehow this risk factor comes in. What do you think? Well, you know, a part of it, I believe, is generational as well right? Those who grew up with computers from an early age, um, everything is done the, the computer. It's normalized, right? And a lot of it is, is casual stuff. It's socialization. It's family conversations. So then all of a sudden to have a, a, a doctor appointment or a therapy session online, again, us having to model for them what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. But we're human too, Right. Every, believe me, I have many colorful shirts I would love to wear. I even when I was getting dressed this morning, I looked in my closet and it was like, oh, I'm training. I can't wear this today. Um, I'm going to be on camera because there's a pattern to it and it's distracting. Um, I would love to be in a sweatshirt on a Friday, um, but I have to maintain that professionalism at all times when I'm working. And there is this mindset of work versus personal. I'm going to talk to you, Nancy, or train and, and speak differently on this compared to Zooming with my sister later on tonight and, and, you know, visiting family. So some of it, you know, is we have to help the folks we work with realize that this is therapy. And we also have to keep our feet grounded and remind ourselves that this is therapy because we're human and it gets comfortable. Absolutely. Um, I real quick, just run story. I had that gentleman who went to Penn State. It's about three, four hours away from here. The very first time he logged on in his, or his fraternity house, lounged out on his bed with his computer on his legs and all he had on was boxer shorts. And sadly, I could see up the boxer shorts and immediately, um, you know, turned off the camera, covered up everything and was just like, listen, Chris, like, please put clothes on. He just didn't get it. He just he needed to be trained and educated on this is a therapy session. This isn't your buddy chatting with you in the frat house to see how your first week of classes are. This is your therapist. Right. And just so folks don't get worried, uh, Chris is not the name of the patient. No, just no, use not that as an example. Yeah. So um, here's some great boundary recommendations from this Drum and Littleton article. Maintain professional hours and respect the timing of the sessions. No 10 o'clock sessions at night. Oh, no six in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Ensure timely and consistent feedback. Manage excessive communications. Ensure private, consistent, professional, and culturally sensitive services. Privacy is really important. We can't stress that enough. Model appropriate self boundaries. Ensure the, your privacy. Use professional language. Right. All these things very very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, here's some steps to improve and enhance your telehealth skills. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, focus on uh, since clinicians lose some connection through touch and gesture, we have to heighten our verbal engagement skills. We've talked about this. Be more purposeful in our tempo of our speech mm -hmm. and tone because uh, in the virtual environment, um, we might need to talk a little faster. We might need to be a little bit more animated to keep that connection and practice doing that on Practice on your tempo and tone. Uh, be on the lookout for that disinhibition effect mm -hmm. so you're not going 10 minutes over in your sessions. Yep. Uh, half an hour over, you start just chatting uh, rather than doing your job. And that's doing counseling and forming effective therapeutic relationships. And if you're a clinical supervisor, check in man, with your mm -hmm. clinicians about disinhibition effect, being too casual. Definitely. You want to add anything here, Muriel? Believe it or not, just from my own personal experience, I'm more likely to bring somebody in from the waiting room early as opposed to letting sessions run over. But that's the same thing. It's, it's not sticking to a, a healthy boundary of this oh, is your session point. time. I'll be like, yeah. oh, they're waiting. I'll let them in when I'm not doing anything. Um, what message does that give? That gives right. them that, you know, we can chit chat or, okay, the session didn't really start yet, but I'm 
I'm already here. So right. mm-hmm. there we go. Great point. There's guidelines available. You can see the site, uh, the links. Okay. And uh, we have like two seconds, Mary Ellen, to go over this, and we can certainly spend more time uh, if we get another opportunity to yeah. speak to you all. But make sure you have this structure. There's a great checklist that we can make available to you. Sierra will uh, uh, give you access to that. So it'll be one of the handouts um, about a checklist that people can follow Mm -hmm. when they're uh, getting ready to do sessions and making sure, man, that you have a phone number where you can reach a patient or a client if the Mm -hmm. sessions get disruptive, what to do if the session gets disruptive, who calls whom, the location where the patient's at today Mm -hmm. of the session. Mary Ellen, how am I doing? Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, an emergency contact person. If I get worried about you and you make comments that you're going to hurt yourself or hurt others, that I can contact um, an emergency contact person, let them know what's going on, that I'm making sure I have the release for that. And that if I need to, I need your location so that I can send emergency personnel or the police to your location. Yeah, I think too what happens is, you know, you don't have to go over this verbatim every session. I log on, I see the same background. I know you're at your house. I don't have to verify the street address. But if I know it's someplace different that I've never seen you log on before, I need to get where that is, that location um, yep. for safety purposes. Yep. So that's real important to, to, to stay up on. And we'll, we'll send you a copy of that that you can use, and mm-hmm. that's helpful. Okay. So uh, we're ending up here, and we should have enough time for questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as we, you can see that um, telebehavioral health is equivalent to in-person care. There's certainly a large uh, ba- uh, research base on mental health services. Mm-hmm. Uh, the research base for SUD treatment is growing, especially with opioid use disorders. Uh, patients like it, um, clinicians could be initially reluctant, and that engagement, therapeutic alliance, and presence, it's the same thing, but different, and that's why mm-hmm. we look at telepresence. Uh, telehealth tips can inform practice and be aware of disinhibition effect, and mm-hmm. there's boundary recommendations. Uh, there's national guidelines that provide some uh, guidance for you, uh, and there's re- resources for training and technical assistance uh, is available. So, Mary Ellen, do you want to do these last points here? Yeah, just the final, you know, and I said it early on, um, not every clinician, it's not for everyone. It's not for every, every client we work with, and telehealth is not for every clinician. Um, and if you choose not to participate in it, you know, um, then you, then you're not going to participate in it. And that's okay. I mean, yes, there is this ever meeting demand, but it's a modality. And so, you know, you've got to think and be honest with yourself. Can I do it? Am am I able to do it? And do I want to do it? Um, you know, and, and have frank conversations with the, the clients as well. You know, it is a little slower process. Sometimes I'll do a five or 10 minute, let's practice on the computer with a client who is ambivalent about it. Um, You know, so there's ways around it, but it's just, it's not a cookie cutter, I think is the most important piece. Can't force it. Absolutely. And plus, you know, the, uh, oh, I don't know if I want to do, you know, uh, virtual service delivery. So if you're not going to do it, who's going to do it? And do they have the training? Yep. And one of the points I want to make is Amazon just la- launched yeah. their, uh, uh, their telehealth virtual uh, mental health uh, service delivery. And, uh, you know, are they trained? Who are the therapists that are doing the services? Mm-hmm. And um, who do we want doing the work? We want well-trained people who are well-trained as clinicians and then well-trained in telebehavioral health. Mm-hmm. Definitely. All right, Sierra, we'll be quiet and answer questions or we'll stop uh, our uh, slides. I'm going to stop sharing. Yep, totally. We we do have um, a question that came up. 
Uh, this information is all phenomenal. Thank you. Are there any additional tips you may have specific to working with and establishing trust with youth, adolescents, young adults who are struggling with substance use? You know, I think the first thing I would say, Suzette, is um, be patient and be slow. Uh, or I should say be patient because the process is a little slower than face to face and that's OK. Um, it does take some time. And um, but it does happen if you're working with folks, too, who you have to work with a significant other or parents as well. It's, it's creating those relationships, too, and making sure there's this comfort on the computer. Um, I, I guess what I would say most of all is just be patient. You know, you can do trust building things. Again, it doesn't always have to be like, you know, uh, a deep therapy session. Uh, it could be bringing in a YouTube video and practicing mindfulness um, or doing some DBT stuff that you've discovered on, on YouTube or something like that, or having them bring something that they want to share. That helps to build that relationship as well. So I hope that has helped. Great, thank you. Oh, just another question came in. Um, folks, just to let you know, we do have about five minutes for questions. So feel free to start posting in the chat and hopefully we'll get to them. Uh, how do you create an environment that creates therapeutic engagement when a youth attention is divided by distracting family members or a noisy environment? So sometimes we do have to, again, drive the bus and say, look, this just might not work for you with you sitting at home. Let's brainstorm. Um, is there someplace else you could be? I've had a situation where um, I worked with an adolescent and the mom kept popping their head in the session uh, into the kid's bedroom. And so it became a conversation with the mother. And unfortunately, I had to refer the kid out to a face-to-face -face, uh, in-person therapist because the mom couldn't respect the boundaries. Um, so yeah, there are times when we have to pull the plug if it's not appropriate or if they can't play nice, so to speak, or we have to come up with other options where they could be um, to get the services. That might be sitting in the library in the school uh, with a headset on or in a private room um, if, if it can't happen from their house. Well, you've had uh, patients who've been out in the garage. I have a patient who sits in his detached garage every week. I have another patient who, um, well, she sits in her car. Um, you know, I mean, if you have a kid who's got his own car and they can sit in the car and do it, that's great. Or even if they have the ability and the parent allows them to sit, you know, somewhere quietly. Um, we do, we come up with things just to, you know, but number one is safety and figuring out where they're going to be. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Mary Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, one more thank you. Also, how do you work with youth who don't have their cameras on and are not re as responsive to the clinician's questions? So again, Tracy, I think it comes down to does the, the, the youth um, have to have the camera on? And if they don't, you know, that is probably uncomfortable, I would imagine, but maybe just, again, bringing in some videos. You can bring up a whiteboard, play tic-tac-toe. Um, again, it doesn't have to be 53 minutes of intense clinical. Uh, when I worked, again, with the adolescents in Florida, you know, we would shoot pool. We, we would play card games and chess and checkers or whatever just to get them to relax. Believe it or not, there's some new virtual reality stuff coming out that is mind-blowing um <laughs> it's unbelievable i saw a demo last week and like if you want to take the kid to the beach it, it's better than any xbox or playstation i've ever seen um so there's some amazing stuff going on out there that is eventually gonna springboard into more work with adolescents and younger kids and the use of uh virtual reality and, and environments. It's pretty wild. I agree. If you think about it, <clears throat> when I used to do uh, adolescent face-to-face -face services, we'd go out and shoot baskets. We, mm -hmm. We'd go for a walk. We would uh, get some good energy, uh, go fishing because we were down near the river. And then in between, it was like, and so how are things going with your dad? Well, you know, right. and, and you just engage. It's just that engagement piece uh, to get people 
to get adolescents or y- younger mm-hmm. kids calm enough and to trust you. And then the information comes out in between like shooting a basket or uh, right. playing some kind of game. Uh, and, and, and we have to be more gentle with ourselves as therapists and counselors that uh, we're not playing basketball because we feel like we need exercise right now. It, there's right. a therapeutic purpose for everything that we do. And I think we have to keep that in mind that it, there's a therapeutic purpose for what we're doing. And in fact, like I said earlier, if that means my kid spends 10 minutes playing a video game while lying on their bed and I get them to chat with me about why they can't stand their mother today, at least I got them to connect with me. Um, believe it or not, too, if you use Zoom, I don't know a lot of them, but I know Zoom has a lot of different app add-ins where you can bring in games or things to do. It doesn't have to always be YouTube. Um, again, it's just knowing what you're bringing in and that you know how to use it before you introduce it to the session. So it's thinking outside the box, gang. A lot of outside the box with adolescents. This is great, great information. And a lot of folks are echoing that in the chat. Um, well, we are at time. So thank you so much, Nancy and Mary Ellen. Um, attendees, there will be an automatic evaluation that'll pop up. Um, it's just five multiple choice questions. If you could please answer it, uh, it really helps us uh, improve our webinars and figure out where to go next. Uh, thank you all for attending and please stay safe and healthy. Yes, thanks for having us. Thanks, Sierra. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you to you both. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now. Bye.